so for the next two hours or so, we're going to cover two-way post-tension slab design. Uh, now, just a precursor or just a heads up, um, I'm not going to be doing any numerical examples. Um, if this is more of an overview or what to do and maybe more importantly what not to do or to what to look out for. If a two-way hand example webinar would be um, desired by the group, uh, please put that in the um, comment box when you get at the end of the seminar, and then we can uh, hopefully get enough responses. We'll create a hand design just to go through the whole, you know, the nitty-gritty of uh, PT slab design through the calcs. Uh, so basically what I'm going to do here is going to talk about two-way slab design with post tension concrete. As I mentioned before in my other webinars, we do have a book out there that the fourth edition was released in 2019. It's broken into two parts. One, the first is the undergraduate class that is actually taught at several universities and actually starting up um, in about a month at UCLA in Cal Poly Slow. Uh, the other half of the book is, you know, quote unquote, real world examples and pictures. We put a lot of pictures of just what we've seen out in the um, job site, what not to do, what happens if you go bad, and stuff like that. So there's a you know good part of the book that's educational, and for you know the calculation perspective, and another half of the book is educational for uh, you know just how things go in the in the real world, not so much through the calculation. So if you're interested, there's a whole chapter on two-way slab design uh, that hopefully you'd find interesting if you find this part of the webinar interesting as well. Uh, general overview, uh, two-way slabs are used in all types of buildings. Pretty much any kind of building you have, I can use a two-way slab to hold it up. Not a hard and fast rule, but typically if you have a rectangular system less than two to one, that typically be, uh, generates an economical two-way slab. If you're much more than that, typically just by default, um, the slab becomes or the system becomes more of a one-way slab and beam system. Uh, you typically have no continuous supports, meaning no walls or no uh, girder line. So effectively, you just have columns that provide uh, the vertical resistance with obviously localized shear walls. Uh, the slab has to be designed to act in two directions because you have no beam or girders. Uh, basically, one-way slabs are only designed, as the name implies, in one direction. And then you have 0018 or 100 PSI in the weak direction just to provide some type of crack control. Uh, the columns are designed primarily in a two-way slab for axial There is some moment transfer. It's not zero. But if you're comparing it to a long-span beam column, which has a lot more girth, and obviously uh, a beam going 65 feet is going to have a much larger crank, that moment is you know, probably 10 times what you're going to get with a two-way slab moment. Uh, the columns are designed for axial load. Again, the, the moment is there, but the moment is minimal. So the system, uh, the shear design is punching shear beams and girders typically have a one-way shear design, uh, which is, you know, obviously extremely important, but in two-way slabs, punching shear is critical. In general, uniform loads are best done with a two-way slab just because of the way the rebar is laid out, especially the most tensioning in terms of the drapes. If you have large point loads, whether it's a podium slab, um, let's say a, a bank or something, and there's a large safe on your slab, it's hard to reinforce with post tensioning and or rebar just because you don't have the system depth. The moment is obviously greater if it's you know PL over 4 versus W squared over 24 or 12, whatever you're doing. So if you have a whole bunch of large point loads, and large meaning 10, 15, 25,000 pounds depending on your slab thickness, those are challenging to do, and a lot of times you may need beams to actually provide additional or adequate support. Now, in general, the slide has nothing to do with post-tensioning. It's just a general two-way slab layout. Effectively, what you're doing here is a slab goes in one direction in a one-way system and then supported either directly on a bearing wall or the beam takes it left to right. So you're only designing basically one direction for that slab. The difference for a two-way system, which you can see here, is the slab needs to be designed this way and then needs to be designed to go left and right to take it to the vertical support provided by the columns. So instead of doing an analysis of a one-way slab and then a beam, you just, instead of you're replacing the beam with another slab design. Again, nothing that's particular to post-tensioning, but basically you are replacing the slab, or excuse me, replacing the beam with an additional slab design to keep the vertical load carrying capacity working in both directions. So two-way PT slabs uh, are typically relatively thin. Again, if you're looking for post-tensioning or the benefits of post-tensioning, typically our slab thickness and or beam thickness is less than the rebar only equivalent. Unless you're dealing with, 
you know, mat foundations or you're holding up, you know, a whole another building or something, a steel building. Typically, the slabs in most applications for apartments, hotels, parking, stuff like that are in the 12 to 7 inch range. Uh, typically, don't do much than less than 7 inches for two way flat plates. Again, you can do, a, let's say, a 5 inch or a 6 inch two way flat plate. You would just have to have a very, very, very tight column space in which, you know, if you can put take typically take columns out, you're, everyone's usually a lot happier with that, especially the architect. But again, nothing you couldn't do, but typically seven is about as low as we go. Obviously, the slab thickness is based on the longest typical span. Uh, balance loads are still critical, much like they are in one way in beams.